Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, it's hard to preach about the parable of the sower and the seed when you're a city boy and you're serving a congregation that has a lot of farmers in it. But I'm just going to apologize right now for anything dumb that I say about farming in the sermon this morning. Jesus was able to preach this parable because he lived in a society in which almost everyone had a direct connection to farming. And they all did it pretty much the same way. And it was different from the way that farmers do it today. Back in Jesus' day, if a farmer wanted to plant a field, he plowed that field up just like farmers do today. But he didn't have the equipment to cause the seed to be planted in nice straight lines with each plant an equal distance from the rest. Instead, what he did was he put his seed into a bag and he went out to that field and he took handfuls of it and he threw it out onto that ground. And so that meant, of course, that at least some of the seed didn't always go where the farmer wanted it to go. That's what Jesus pictures for us this morning. And he was not talking about farming, which is the only reason that a city boy like me can preach about this parable. Jesus was talking about how the gospel works in our hearts. In the parable, a man goes out to sow seed, and some of the seed that he throws out lands on a path. You all know what a path is like. The ground is beaten down hard. The seed just sits there on the top, and birds came along and ate it. Some of the seed that he threw landed on rocky soil. Israel is a very rocky, hilly country, and there are places where the layer of soil above that hard rock is very, very thin. So the plants sprang up right away, but there was no place for them to put down roots. So when the sun came up, those plants were withered. Some of the seed landed among the weeds. Now, they had no herbicides back then, so even if a farmer very carefully cleared the weeds all out of his field, the wind would blow seeds from other thorns and thistles back into it, and you know how it works. Those weeds grow just as fast as the good stuff does. Sometimes it seems like it grows a lot faster, and those weeds sucked the nutrients and the water out of that soil, and they choked off those plants. But fortunately for that farmer, some of his seed fell on good soil, and it produced a crop. It yielded 30, 60, 100 times what he had sowed. That's the parable that Jesus told. And he tells us what it means. The seed is the gospel. And the different types of soil are people who hear that message. The seed that's sown on the path represents people who hear the gospel, but they don't really understand it, or maybe they don't understand that it applies to them. And the devil comes and he takes that message away before they really have a chance to contemplate what God is saying to them, and so they never come to faith. The seed that landed on the rocky soil represents people who hear the gospel and they receive it with joy. They are so excited to know the Lord, and it's fun to watch their excitement. But they have no root. They never mature in their faith. So when persecution or trouble comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns, the weeds, represent people who believe the gospel, but they always have something else going on in their lives. The cares, the worries, the concerns of this life take up too much of their time. It's not that anything they're doing is necessarily wrong in and of themselves, but it's always more important to them than coming to church and hearing the word so their faith dies for lack of being fed. And of course, the seed that fell on the good soil represents Christians who hear the word, who feed their faith so that it grows and they bring forth fruits of faith. The Christian life. Joy in the Lord, strength in troubled times, service to their neighbors. That's the parable. So my friends, what kind of soil are you? 
First of all, let's consider that question from a congregational perspective. What I mean is, in this parable, Jesus gives us a picture of congregational life from now until he returns, and it's kind of discouraging. Not everybody who hears the gospel is going to believe. Not everyone who comes to faith is going to stay in the faith. Not everyone who stands up here in the front of our church and confesses their faith in Jesus as a youth or as an adult is going to continue to feed their faith for as long as they live. And if you've belonged to this church for any time at all, you know people who haven't come back, maybe even members of your own family. And maybe you could remember a time when they were excited about what they were learning. Maybe you yourself invested time and money and effort in getting them to Lutheran Elementary School or Sunday School or in helping them to be able to come and take adult classes. But now it's been years since they were in God's house. Jesus gives us four examples of where the seed can fall. And only one has a good outcome. There are so many things that work against our faith. If you've ever tried to share your faith with somebody, you've probably had the, example, or the experience of them not believing what you're saying. If you've ever talked to someone about coming back to church, you might have had the experience of them not wanting to talk about it or even getting mad, or maybe the experience of them promising to be here, but then they don't show up. Three out of four of the examples that Jesus gives us are like that for a reason. That's what we're going to experience. Now, I'm not actually trying to make you more discouraged. Rather, my point is this. It takes a miracle of the Holy Spirit for the gospel to work. Sinners reject the gospel. That's what sinners do. You and I are predisposed to rejecting the gospel. And the only reason that we are here today is because God did that miracle. Think about your own life. How many hours a week do you spend on God's word? If you come to church, that's one. Bible class is two. If you do home devotions, that's what, 15 minutes a day, the other six days a week, add that to whatever time you spend on your own reading the Bible or other devotional literature, that's what, three or four more hours? So a really dedicated Christian spends three to six hours a week feeding his or her faith. Now, how many hours a week do you spend working, watching TV, surfing the internet, driving, working on your house. Do you see my point? We all spend way more time on those things than we do studying God's Word. And logically speaking, what should have the greatest impact on our lives? Isn't it the things that we spend the most time and effort on? And yet somehow, you're here. You are here. You are believers. Because God packed his power into that gospel message. And the return, the yield that God gets for that gospel that he shares with you is amazing. He takes those few hours that we have to dedicate to him and he makes us his. He changes our lives. He prepares us for those days when trouble and sorrow comes. He teaches us to put him and eternal life first in our lives. He takes those few hours and he uses them to cause us to bring forth fruits of faith 30, 60, 100 times what God has sown. So don't lose heart. Not even when it looks like the whole world is stacked up against us and our congregation is shrinking. Jesus is still working through the gospel. And you never know when he's going to use our efforts to bring someone else to faith. Now, I've got to be a little careful here. In this parable, Jesus was not teaching us that when someone drifts away, we're supposed to shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well, I guess the rocks or the weeds got them. We're supposed to go after them, and if we're too lazy to do that, that's sin. And likewise, Jesus does not have a category. He doesn't have a part in the parable for people whose feelings were hurt by their pastor or by a brother or sister in the faith. When people leave us because we sin against them, we pastors and we Christian people need to repent of that sin. 
But Jesus does want us to recognize how blessed we are that he has made us to be the good soil. He wants us to get down on our knees every day and thank God that he uses spiritual roundup to kill those weeds that are springing up all around us, that he puts an extra measure of good soil over the rocks that live in our hearts, that he kept away the devil's birds long enough for us to hear that message and truly come to faith. And my friends, no matter how rocky or weedy or path-like the ground under our feet seems to be, Jesus always works through the gospel. Trust him. That's one way to look at this parable. There's another way which maybe is a little more natural for us. What kind of soil are you? That's a question for self-examination. How faithful are we to the message God has given us. Now we're all here in church this morning, so hopefully that means that we aren't the seed that was sown on the path where the faith was taken away. But you know what? I've been standing up in front of churches for a really long time now, and on almost any given Sunday, it's easy for me to look out and see people who aren't paying attention. I'll be honest with you. One of the reasons I became a pastor is because I find it hard to pay attention when somebody else is preaching. I figured if I was preaching every week, at least I'd spend some time thinking about Jesus. Don't we all have to admit that there are days when we make it easy for the devil to take the word away from us? And don't we all have to admit that the rocks in our heart sometimes are really close to the top of the soil, that's our sinful nature. It's always there. Now, God does work through the gospel. He makes us new. He gives us faith. But we Lutherans never forget that we are sinners and we are saints at the same time. Every day of my life, the believer in me wants to serve the Lord. But every day of my life, the unbeliever in me wants to do something different. And he resists all my efforts to live a Christian life. He does his level best to keep me from putting down roots in my faith. And right next to him are the weeds, all those things that distract us in this life. Jesus points to two things. He talks about the cares and worries of this life. How often do you have trouble sleeping? How many times do we find our minds racing because we're worried about our kids or our marriage or our job? How much stress do we put ourselves through in life and how much does that separate us from God? The other thing that Jesus points to is the deceitfulness of wealth. It's deceitfulness, huh? How many hours do we spend every week gathering wealth, working, and managing our investments? How often don't we act like our standard of living is the definition of our lives? And then, how much time and energy do we put into enjoying all that wealth? How many activities do we sign our kids up for and we can't get them to church? How many hours a week do we spend on all kinds of different leisure activities we have trouble giving God an hour or even 15 minutes a day of our time? My friends, it would be a mistake for us to imagine that each one of us here is one or another of the types of soil that Jesus talked about today. We're all of them. And sometimes all in the same day. You know, sometimes we can come to church on Sunday and we can go home glad about the message that we heard and the time we spent with people we love. We can feel like that was the best part of our day. And sometimes before night falls, we're living among the weeds. And we're showing how close to the surface the rocks and our sinful nature really are. Or sometimes we're even imitating the path where it's so easy for the devil to take the word away. That's life in a sinful world. And you know what? That's exactly why Jesus told this parable. Because that's where we live. So what's the answer? A life of repentance. Every day, we go to Jesus and we confess that we have not brought forth the fruits that he's looking for. We haven't come close to a 30-fold yield, let alone a 100-fold. But then we trust that he has forgiven us. We rejoice in the good news that Jesus died and paid even for that failure. We embrace the promise 
that all of our sin is gone forever. We repeat that message to ourselves. And then we go and live for him. We bring forth those fruits of faith. You know where that starts? With the word. Now, obviously, our Christian life is a whole lot more than just sitting around reading our Bibles. How we treat our parents, our children, our spouses, our co-workers, even our enemies. All of that is supposed to be a fruit of faith. But the first fruit, the fruit that leads to all the other fruits, is hearing and studying the gospel. We need to be in the word. My friends, it's my job to teach you that word. But it's your job to come and hear. It's my job to encourage you to lead a Christian life, but it's your job to make that a priority for you. It's my job to help you understand what that word means, to help you to apply that word to your life, but it's your job to take the message home and meditate on what it means for you today and tomorrow, and then come back for more. And you know what? If you do your job, God promises that he will work through that gospel that you hear. He will strengthen your faith. He will cause you to bring forth more fruits of faith than you could possibly imagine. So, my friends, be the good soil. Let that gospel take root in you.